I'm going to give you the instructions for this test. I'll introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you will hear this sound. Remember to play each piece twice. Now open your question paper and look at part 1. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. You hear part of a radio program in which an art expert is talking about a picture. Now look at questions 1 and 2. So, now over to Mark Amos, who's going to tell us about this week's painting, which you'll remember can be seen on our webpage. Mark? Thanks, Sandra. Yes, today's picture is by John Audubon, who, by coincidence, was born this very day in 1785, who's the most celebrated American ornithological artist. And as this is also the season when swallows make their annual migration from south to north, I've selected an illustration of that particular bird from Audubon's monumental work, The Birds of America, as this week's picture. The birds are shown with two chicks peeping from a hole in a sandbank. And in a moment, I'll tell you about his technique. But first, the man himself. Audubon was an impulsive, larger-than-life character with a propensity for self-mythologizing. Born in what is now Haiti in the Caribbean, the son of a French merchant, he was educated in France. At the age of 18, he was sent to America to oversee his father's estate near Philadelphia, where he spread the completely unfounded rumour that he was of royal descent. Having little interest in estate management, he gradually squandered his family's money while exploring the wilds of America, indulging his two principal passions, hunting and drawing birds. Now play the recording again. So, now over to Mark Amos, who's going to tell us about this week's painting, which you'll remember can be seen on our webpage. Mark? Thanks, Sandra. Yes, today's picture is by John Audubon, who, by coincidence, was born this very day in 1785 who's the most celebrated American ornithological artist. And as this is also the season when swallows make their annual migration from south to north, I've selected an illustration of that particular bird from Audubon's monumental work, The Birds of America, as this week's picture. The birds are shown with two chicks peeping from a hole in a sandbank. And in a moment, I'll tell you about his technique. But first the man himself. Audubon was an impulsive, larger-than-life character with a propensity for self-mythologizing. Born in what is now Haiti in the Caribbean, the son of a French merchant, he was educated in France. At the age of 18, he was sent to America to oversee his father's estate near Philadelphia, where he spread the completely unfounded rumor that he was of royal descent. Having little interest in estate management, he gradually squandered his family's money while exploring the wilds of America, indulging his two principal passions, hunting and drawing birds. Extract 2. You hear part of a radio program talking about redesigning your living space. Now look at questions 3 and 4. If you're planning to redesign your living space, maybe take down internal walls, move door openings, or even build an extension, 
getting a clear mental image of your different options can be a difficult process. It's all very well sketching out a few ideas on paper, but getting a grasp of how your new home will feel to walk through is something that many of us leave to chance, which, considering the expense of these kinds of projects, is really quite a significant risk, isn't it, Luis? Well, Amy, it needn't be. The good news is that if you're willing to invest a little bit of money and, more importantly, time in formulating your ideas, it can be greatly minimised. One of the most rewarding ways is to invest in one of the many home design software packages currently available for home computers. In essence, these mean you can automatically translate a simple 2D drawing into a 3D model of your home, which can be viewed from any angle. In theory, enabling you to get a great feel for the new spaces you're intending to create, or to spot any potential problems at the design stage. Now play the recording again. If you're planning to redesign your living space, maybe take down internal walls, move door openings, or even build an extension, getting a clear mental image of your different options can be a difficult process. It's all very well sketching out a few ideas on paper, but getting a grasp of how your new home will feel to walk through is something that many of us leave to chance, which, considering the expense of these kinds of projects, is really quite a significant risk, isn't it, Luis? Well, Amy, it needn't be. The good news is that if you're willing to invest a little bit of money and, more importantly, time in formulating your ideas, it can be greatly minimised. One of the most rewarding ways is to invest in one of the many home design software packages currently available for home computers. In essence, these mean you can automatically translate a simple 2D drawing into a 3D model of your home, which can be viewed from any angle, in theory, enabling you to get a great feel for the new spaces you're intending to create, or to spot any potential problems at the design stage. Extract 3. You hear part of a discussion about how the wildlife films broadcast on television are reviewed by journalists. Now look at questions 5 and 6. Last autumn, a newspaper TV critic praised one wildlife program in fulsome terms, saying, It ticks all the usual boxes for the sort of thing it is. Hushed narration, pounding orchestral soundtrack, and beautiful photography, of course. A few weeks later, another journalist previewing an episode of another wrote, Maybe it's because we're jaded by the brilliance of this series, but tonight's program is a shade disappointing. For the most part, the animals we witness are not winners either. Wolverines may be vicious, but they won't win any prizes at the Natural History Beauty Pageant. I know what you mean. The standards are pretty high, and so any reviewer uses that as their starting point. It's hard for the filmmaker to impress us any more with this kind of programme. Yeah, I don't deny that, but what alarms me is this sort of tacit agreement between critics about the criteria by which nature films should be judged. Dramatic music, plenty of violence, big, charismatic animals, and breathtaking photography. No prizes for the wolverines of this world, nor, sadly, for thought-provoking sensitivity, quiet reflection, intelligence, all of which I think count for a lot more. Now play the recording again. Last autumn, a newspaper TV critic praised one wildlife program in fulsome terms, saying, It ticks all the usual boxes for the sort of thing it is. Hushed narration, pounding orchestral soundtrack, and beautiful photography, of course. A few weeks later, another journalist previewing an episode of another wrote, Maybe it's because we're jaded by the brilliance of this series, but tonight's programme is a shade disappointing. For the most part, the animals we witness are not winners either. 
Wolverines may be vicious, but they won't win any prizes at the natural history beauty pageant. I know what you mean. The standards are pretty high, and so any reviewer uses that as their starting point. It's hard for the filmmaker to impress us any more with this kind of program. Yeah, I don't deny that, but what alarms me is this sort of tacit agreement between critics about the criteria by which nature films should be judged: dramatic music, plenty of violence, big charismatic animals, and breathtaking photography. No prizes for the wolverines of this world, nor sadly for thought-provoking sensitivity, quiet reflection, intelligence. All of which I think count for a lot more. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear part of a radio program in which the psychologist Simon Strang is talking about the subject of boredom. For questions seven to fourteen, complete the sentences. In the exam, you have forty-five seconds to look at part two. Today we're talking about boredom. What is it, and how can we cope with it? Now, if I said, "How would you like to go on a space mission to find out more about the planet Mars?" you'd probably find the prospect quite thrilling, and I think it's unlikely that you'd say, "Oh no, how boring!" But in actual fact, boredom is likely to be one of the biggest challenges for people going on such a mission. Mars, after all, is a long way away, and the round trip will take around seventeen months—rather a long time to spend in a small spaceship where there's little in the way of entertainment. What's more, add on the training and preparation stages, and you'd probably be giving up two to three years of your life to such a project. So you'd need to be pretty committed to it. But it's coping with the boredom of the actual trip that interests the European Space Agency. So they've set up a simulation. They're locking twelve volunteers up in just such a small space for exactly that length of time in order to study how they'll cope with the boredom. The aim is to gain insight into both individual human behaviour and group dynamics under the kinds of conditions astronauts would experience on a mission to Mars. On the real trip, lack of space, lack of privacy, a high workload, and the stress associated with mechanical breakdowns, etc., will all lead to all sorts of tensions. But it is thought that these tensions will actually come to the surface when the astronauts have less to do. In moments of boredom, therefore, dissatisfaction concerning the limited variety of available food or the infrequent nature of contacts with family and friends may well become the focus of the astronaut's feelings. So, what is boredom? Well, there is actually more than one type. There are, for example, activities such as listening to a boring lecture or waiting for a delayed plane in an airport, which tend to be of a temporary nature. This situational boredom contrasts with the boredom of a routine job, for example, where something that in itself may be interesting the first time you do it becomes boring when you have to do it over and over again. This we can define as repetitive boredom. But it's hard to grasp the concept of boredom itself because it doesn't really have any qualities of its own. Dr. Svensson, author of the book *The Philosophy of Boredom*, talks about a lack of personal meaning as perhaps summing up what boredom is. Other researchers have looked at how boredom affects people to determine whether some personality types cope better than others. What they have found is that people often assume that the opposite of boredom is excitement. 
That's why parents take their bored children to a theme park. But often, boredom is more to do with lack of social interactivity than it has to do with lack of physical activity or thrill. So parents might be better off taking their children on a picnic, where they would meet new people and make their own entertainment. So clearly, boredom is something that we have to take into. Now play the recording again. Today we're talking about boredom. What is it, and how can we cope with it? Now, if I said, "How would you like to go on a space mission to find out more about the planet Mars?" you'd probably find the prospect quite thrilling, and I think it's unlikely that you'd say, "Oh no, how boring!" But in actual fact, boredom is likely to be one of the biggest challenges for people going on such a mission. Mars, after all, is a long way away, and the round trip will take around 17 months. Rather a long time to spend in a small spaceship where there's little in the way of entertainment. What's more, add on the training and preparation stages, and you'd probably be giving up two to three years of your life to such a project. So you'd need to be pretty committed to it. But it's coping with the boredom of the actual trip that interests the European Space Agency. So they've set up a simulation. They're locking twelve volunteers up in just such a small space for exactly that length of time in order to study how they'll cope with the boredom. The aim is to gain insight into both individual human behaviour and group dynamics under the kinds of conditions astronauts would experience on a mission to Mars. On the real trip, lack of space, lack of privacy, a high workload, and the stress associated with mechanical breakdowns, etc., will all lead to all sorts of tensions. But it is thought that these tensions will actually come to the surface when the astronauts have less to do. In moments of boredom, therefore, dissatisfaction concerning the limited variety of available food or the infrequent nature of contacts with family and friends may well become the focus of the astronaut's feelings. So, what is boredom? Well, there is actually more than one type. There are, for example, activities such as listening to a boring lecture or waiting for a delayed plane in an airport, which tend to be of a temporary nature. This situational boredom contrasts with the boredom of a routine job, for example, where something that in itself may be interesting the first time you do it becomes boring when you have to do it over and over again. This we can define as repetitive boredom. But it's hard to grasp the concept of boredom itself because it doesn't really have any qualities of its own. Dr. Svensson, author of the book *The Philosophy of Boredom*, talks about a lack of personal meaning as perhaps summing up what boredom is. Other researchers have looked at how boredom affects people to determine whether some personality types cope better than others. What they have found is that people often assume that the opposite of boredom is excitement. That's why parents take their bored children to a theme park, but often. Boredom is more to do with lack of social interactivity than it has to do with lack of physical activity or thrill. So parents might be better off taking their children on a picnic, where they would meet new people and make their own entertainment. So clearly, boredom is something that we have to take into. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear an interview with a woman called Emma Stoneham, who works as a manager in the horse racing industry. For questions fifteen to twenty, choose the answer A, B, C, or D, which fits best according to what you hear. In the exam, you have one minute to look at part three.
My guest today is Emma Stoneham, who's managing director of the local race course, a business with a turnover of over two million pounds a year. The surprising thing about Emma is that at the age of 24, she's the youngest race course MD in the country. How do you come to know so much about racing, Emma? The industry's in my blood. It's as simple as that. I get a fantastic buzz out of every aspect of it, and I always have. I went to school not far from a race course where my dad worked, so it was a fair bet I'd get hooked on the sport from an early age. I started helping him out in his work at the race course from about the age of 14. Sometimes I used to go racing with my friends. We'd sneak in for free and watch the horses. It was great fun. But you're well qualified for the job too, aren't you? Oh, yes. I mean, I did a general business studies degree at university and could have gone into any one of a number of industries. But even then, the racing bug kept on nibbling away. <laughs> I eventually realised I really wanted to have a go at it. I didn't want my dad to be accused of nepotism, however, so I decided to make my own way. After graduating, I got a place in a two-week intensive course run by the British Horse Racing Board. I was lucky. There aren't many places going, and there's no shortage of competition for them. The course focuses on all aspects of racing, so there was lots to learn, but I absolutely loved it. And two jobs down the line, you're an MD. Tell us about race days. Race meetings take place every two to three weeks, with 70 to 100 horses at each meeting and crowds of up to 6,000. We get all the big names, uh, owners and jockeys, and we try to look after them well because their efforts underpin the entire sport. The way it works is that we release the dates of our meetings and then they decide which ones they want to fit into their schedule. It involves a lot of intricate planning. And there are so many different characters in the racing industry, and you have to try to cater for them all. They're great people, and there's a real sense of camaraderie. Everybody knows everybody. But you enjoy those days? Whenever racing is going on, I get such a buzz from it. There's just so many different reasons you can enjoy it. You can go as a family, take part in a company event, have a great day out with colleagues from work, or get all dressed up and have a picnic. It's for everyone. For me, running the race course, it's living on the edge a lot of the time because whatever comes up has to be dealt with. But that's what makes it fun. When things get hectic, I just keep thinking, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, and never get bored with it. I also see my job as all about passing on the enthusiasm I have to everyone around me. That's important. But things can go wrong, I imagine. Oh, they do, yes. Our two-day midwinter event usually brings in an excellent crowd. It can be the busiest of the year, but the weather can be a problem. We knew several weeks ahead that the day was likely to be hit by frost, and we'd taken all the precautions we could, including laying sheets on the course, such as on the takeoff and landing points near the hurdles. On the day, however, the ground was still incredibly hard, and the welfare of the horses and jockeys had to take precedence. We had no choice but to call it off. Of course, if we lose a meeting like this, it still means we have to pay staff and other costs too. But any other decision would have been irresponsible. So you made big losses? It was a blow. It means we will have to work harder than ever to make this year's meetings a success. But we'll do it. We simply have to put what has happened behind us, concentrate on the months ahead. Fortunately, we'd already drawn up a master plan to update facilities at the race course, and we'd sold off some land so that a hotel can be built. It'll improve our events business if we're able to offer accommodation on site. So, by making adjustments to the budgets for that, we can absorb any losses. But it's all still going ahead regardless. Emma, best of luck with that, and thank you for joining us today. Now play the recording again. My guest today is Emma Stoneham, who's managing director of the local race course, a business with a turnover of over two million pounds a year. The surprising thing about Emma is that at the age of 24, she's the youngest race course MD in the country. 
How do you come to know so much about racing, Emma? <laughs> the industry's in my blood. It's as simple as that. I get a fantastic buzz out of every aspect of it, and I always have. I went to school not far from a race course where my dad worked, so it was a fair bet I'd get hooked on the sport from an early age. I started helping him out in his work at the race course from about the age of fourteen. Sometimes I used to go racing with my friends. We'd sneak in for free and watch the horses. It was great fun. But you're well qualified for the job too, aren't you? Oh yes. I mean, I did a general business studies degree at university, and could have gone into any one of a number of industries. But even then, the racing bug kept on nibbling away. <laughs> I eventually realised I really wanted to have a go at it. I didn't want my dad to be accused of nepotism, however, so I decided to make my own way. After graduating, I got a place in a two-week intensive course run by the British Horse Racing Board. I was lucky. There aren't many places going, and there's no shortage of competition for them. The course focuses on all aspects of racing, so there was lots to learn. But I absolutely loved it. And two jobs down the line, you're an MD. Tell us about race days. Race meetings take place every two to three weeks, with seventy to a hundred horses at each meeting, and crowds of up to six thousand. We get all the big names,、uh, owners and jockeys, and we try to look after them well because their efforts underpin the entire sport. The way it works is that we release the dates of our meetings, and then they decide which ones they want to fit into their schedule. It involves a lot of intricate planning, and there are so many different characters in the racing industry, and you have to try to cater for them all. They're great people, and there's a real sense of camaraderie. Everybody knows everybody. But you enjoy those days. Whenever racing is going on, I get such a buzz from it. There's just so many different reasons you can enjoy it. You can go as a family, take part in a company event, have a great day out with colleagues from work, or get all dressed up and have a picnic. It's for everyone. For me, running the racecourse, it's living on the edge a lot of the time because whatever comes up has to be dealt with. But that's what makes it fun. When things get hectic, I just keep thinking it'll be fine, it'll be fine, and never get bored with it. I also see my job as all about passing on the enthusiasm I have to everyone around me. That's important. But things can go wrong, I imagine. Oh, they do. Yes, our two-day midwinter event usually brings in an excellent crowd. It can be the busiest of the year, but the weather can be a problem. We knew several weeks ahead that the day was likely to be hit by frost. And we'd taken all the precautions we could, including laying sheets on the course, such as on the takeoff and landing points near the hurdles. On the day, however, the ground was still incredibly hard, and the welfare of the horses and jockeys had to take precedence. We had no choice but to call it off. Of course, if we lose a meeting like this, it still means we have to pay staff and other costs too. But any other decision would have been irresponsible. So you made big losses. It was a blow. It means we will have to work harder than ever to make this year's meetings a success. But we'll do it. We simply have to put what has happened behind us. Concentrate on the months ahead. Fortunately, we'd already drawn up a master plan to update facilities at the racecourse, and we'd sold off some land so that a hotel can be built. It'll improve our events business if we're able to offer accommodation on site. So, by making adjustments to the budgets for that, we can absorb any losses. But it's all still going ahead, regardless. Emma, best of luck with that, and thank you for joining us today. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You'll hear five short extracts in which five people who have recently changed their accommodation are talking about their experiences. Look at task one. For questions twenty-one to twenty-five, choose from the list A to H the reason each speaker gives for deciding to change their accommodation. Now look at task two. For questions twenty-six to thirty, choose from the list A to H. 
the unexpected disadvantage of their accommodation each speaker mentions. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. In the exam, you have 45 seconds to look at part 4. Speaker 1 I mean, it was a nice house on the whole. I was sharing with five other girls and had a big room. Quite comfortable by student standards, actually. It was the commuting by bus to college that got me down. I was wasting hours a week on it. My new place isn't in such a nice area, but it's just round the corner from college, and the gym's nearby, too. I knew the rent would be higher because I'm on my own here, but I hadn't realised I'd end up paying more for gas and electricity. It's the price you pay for independence, apparently. Anyway, I've signed a six-month contract with a landlord, so I'll be staying. Speaker 2 At first, I was glad of it being a small place. You know, cheap to furnish, easy to clean and all that. But then later, it got to feel a bit cramped. That's when I started looking round. The new place is definitely roomier, but it's a long way out of town. There's a reasonable bus service, but I miss being able to pop out to the shops any time I want. There's none worth going to round here, but I only found that out too late. I'm yet to see what the bills will be like, but the landlord seems nice enough and it's a quiet neighbourhood, so I'll put up with it for the moment. Speaker 3 I think people at work were rather shocked when I said I was moving to the country. But I'd had enough of nine to five in the crowded city and so took advantage of a chance to work from home, working for the same employer, but doing it all online. I thought I'd miss the convenience of city life, but the village shop is surprisingly well stocked and there's even a daily bus service into the local town. I've always lived on my own, so I was surprised at how cut off I felt at first. Fortunately, I've now met some of the neighbours, so things aren't quite as bad and I'm beginning to get involved in local activities a bit more. Speaker 4 I've settled in a bit better now, but I knew the cost of living would be higher here and that I wouldn't be able to afford such a big place. I found a small flat, though, over a shop, which isn't too expensive. <laughs> At least I don't have to share. But when I complained about the inadequate heating, the landlord said basically, take it or leave it. It was a shock, really, but the neighbours told me that he always says that and he'll probably do something in the end. Basically, the firm wanted to move down south, and my job came too, so I didn't have much choice. I was living in a scruffy area before, polluted and lacking in basic facilities, but it was cheap. Speaker 5 I mean, it's much better here. In my last place, I had to put up with miserable flatmates always finding fault with the cleaning, saying I was untidy. We had a very big bust-up and I walked out. At least on my own, I can live how I like, though I didn't really want to live alone. I decided to join a gym or a sports club of some kind to make some new friends and was surprised to find that there's nothing closer than a half-hour's bus ride away. Still, my new neighbour's got an old car he wants to sell, so I might see if I can buy that, because I don't want to feel I'm dependent on public transport. Now play the recording again. Speaker 1 I mean, it was a nice house on the whole. I was sharing with five other girls and had a big room, quite comfortable by student standards, actually. 
It was the commuting by bus to college that got me down. I was wasting hours a week on it. My new place isn't in such a nice area, but it's just round the corner from college, and the gym's nearby too. I knew the rent would be higher because I'm on my own here, but I hadn't realised I'd end up paying more for gas and electricity. It's the price you pay for independence, apparently. Anyway, I've signed a six-month contract with the landlord, so I'll be staying. Speaker two. At first, I was glad of it being a small place, you know, cheap to furnish, easy to clean, and all that. But then later, it got to feel a bit cramped. That's when I started looking round. The new place is definitely roomier, but it's a long way out of town. There's a reasonable bus service, but I miss being able to pop out to the shops any time I want. There's none worth going to round here, but I only found that out too late. I'm yet to see what the bills will be like, but the landlord seems nice enough, and it's a quiet neighbourhood, so I'll put up with it for the moment. Speaker three. I think people at work were rather shocked when I said I was moving to the country. But I'd had enough of nine to five in the crowded city, and so took advantage of a chance to work from home, working for the same employer, but doing it all online. I thought I'd miss the convenience of city life, but the village shop is surprisingly well stocked, and there's even a daily bus service into the local town. I've always lived on my own, so I was surprised at how cut off I felt at first. Fortunately, I've now met some of the neighbours, so things aren't quite as bad. And I'm beginning to get involved in local activities a bit more. Speaker four. I've settled in a bit better now, but I knew the cost of living would be higher here, and that I wouldn't be able to afford such a big place. I found a small flat though over a shop, which isn't too expensive. <laughs> At least I don't have to share. But when I complained about the inadequate heating, the landlord said basically, "Take it or leave it." It was a shock, really, but the neighbours told me that he always says that, and he'll probably do something in the end. Basically, the firm wanted to move down south, and my job came too, so I didn't have much choice. I was living in a scruffy area before, polluted and lacking in basic facilities, but it was cheap. Speaker five. I mean, it's much better here. In my last place, I had to put up with miserable flatmates always finding fault with the cleaning, saying I was untidy. We had a very big bust up, and I walked out. At least on my own, I can live how I like, though I didn't really want to live alone. I decided to join a gym or a sports club of some kind to make some new friends, and was surprised to find that there's nothing closer than a half hour's bus ride away. Still, my new neighbour's got an old car he wants to sell, so I might see if I can buy that because I don't want to feel I'm dependent on public transport.